Hey people, it's Nayan's Toki. Now I've wanted to talk about this for a while, the Kenya protests. So I haven't read this article, so we're all going to read it together. So this is from The Guardian. The title is, The World is Scrabbling to Understand Kenya's Historic Protest. This is what too many are missing, written by Nanjala Nayabola. And I can't leave the link in the comments because YouTube won't. I mean, YouTube link in the description. However, I've given you description so you can find it. So let's start. A finance bill was the trigger, but the backdrop is government debt and blinkered interventions from Western institutions. There is as yet no resolution after an unprecedented week in Kenyan politics. What began as protests against a rush-through finance bill has revealed a crisis of legitimacy within the executive, the legislature and the police that were sent to do the government's bidding. While the protesters have been very clear about their demands, reject the finance bill. Outsiders who are accustomed to simplistic narratives about African politics have been scrambling and failing to understand what these events really mean. Kenya is experiencing a polycrisis of sorts. The finance bill is the immediate trigger, an annually produced document that lays out the government's fiscal strategy and which normally passes without too much comment. But this year it attracted an unprecedented level of attention because it contained several proposals for the taxation of everyday goods, including bread, sanitary towels and more. Kenyans were already struggling with the effects of a collapsing currency and the aftermath of the COVID-19 crisis. However, the government was not merely looking to meet its financial obligations, but to increase year-on-year -year spending from the last finance bill, which had already introduced a number of new taxes. The challenge facing Kenya's treasury is that the previous administration, of which the, pres the current president, William Ruto, was a part, went on a decade-long borrowing and spending spree, incurring massive debts for ill-advised infrastructure projects that were over budget, poorly executed and behind schedule. I think one of those was the port they were building in Mombasa with Chinese help. And of course, the way the Chinese do their infrastructure products is often they are designed either to succeed, in which they have to pay back a huge amount of money, or they fail, in which case they take ownership. So it's a win-win for them. I'm sure there's more that we don't know about. For example, rather than oh yeah, hang on, where is it? Where was I? Oh, for example, rather than renovate the existing railway line that connects the coastal city of Mombasa to the Uganda capital, it borrowed a great deal of money from China to build a new railway line that only runs half across half the country, and which cargo companies have been reluctant to use. Yeah, you see, I was just about to I just mentioned that. A similar story can be told of new overpass in Nairobi, for which hundreds of trees across what was once Africa's greenest capital were cut down. The road was built, but the toll were too expensive, so it remains underutilized. Yet the nation remains on the hook for the debt. In 2013, when Uhura, Kenyatta, and Ruto came into office, Kenya's debt to GDP ratio was 43%. In 2019, it was 61.7%. And so far in 2024, it was running, it is running above 70%. Wow! All this will be bad enough, even if Ruto was also not spending a fortune on an unprecedented expansion in the executive. Although Kenya has ministers and cabinet secretaries, the administration's attempt to create 50 positions known as chief administrative secretaries distributed across the various ministries, as well as an office of the prime cabinet secretary. Not only is this an expensive duplication of roles, it is also illegal, and a court ruling has held that the positions are unconstitutional, leading to Ruto delaying some of the chief administrative secretary positions. In addition, the offices of the First Lady, the Deputy First Lady, and the spouse of the Prime Secretary, each with budget and office and staff, were created to great public fanfare. Many elected legislators in the country routinely flaunt their wealth on social media, sharing videos on TikTok of expensive cars and homes or giving expensively large donations to religious organizations and charities. Kenyan legislators are the second highest paid in the world relative to GDP and would be exempt from many of the new taxes because of their status. The finance bill was described as austerity, but this is not austerity. This is a crash guard from the poor to sustain the lifestyles of the rich. Moreover, it has emerged that these finance bill measures were not suggested by Kenyans but were demanded by the International Monetary Fund, IMF, in return for a financing program. The fact that the measures have destabilized the country should not surprise anyone. IMF measures consistently result in, the outcomes in, the global, in these outcomes in the global majority because they're prepared by people with little to no understanding of the social political context and under the pretext that economics is a rational science instead of highly qualified guesswork. Indeed, in its own risk assessment of the implementation of the measures, the organization foresaw that there would be protests, but urged the government to ignore them and pass the measures anyway. Despite Ruto's political history, which includes an indictment for crimes against humanity at the International Criminal Court, outside Kenya, there has been a great effort to sanitize him. The US President Joe Biden met Ruto days before the finance bill was tabled in the National Assembly, as declared Kenya a key strategic partner of the US. Kenyan police were last week deployed to Haiti on a US-backed mission. Kenya is a frontline state in the U.S. war on terror, 
a base on which drone attacks on Al Shabaab in Somalia launched, and Kenyan soldiers have been in Somalia for more than a decade. A stable Kenya is crucial to Western geopolitics, yet Western institutions are current are set also central to destabilizing the country. And I find it interesting how you hear a lot of these ADOS FBA groups talking about that ain't got nothing to do with us, what happens to black people across the world. But Haiti is not that far from America, and many Haitian immigrants are driven to emigrate to America because of the crisis there. And Kenyan police are now being encouraged to go there and act as enforcers for these Western powers or white nations. So in a way, it's sort of like black cops in America. It's not police brutality if we can get black cops to beat black people. And in the same way, well, it's not us oppressing them if we can get African soldiers and police to come to Haiti and beat them. All these things will have a direct effect on Americans if more Haitians are terrorized into leaving Haiti for America. And even in other ways that we have not even uh, considered. This is why the people of Kenya have been out on the streets. You are witnessing a generational shift in which younger Kenyans, who comprise the majority of the population, are refusing to live on the shroud of silence that previous generations adapted to during decades of authoritarian rule. You are also witnessing an insecure administration responding to a legitimate political challenge with disproportionate force. The president should have de-escalated after the violence of the 27 June protests. Instead, he doubled down, calling protesters treasonous and deploying the military. Soldiers are not police officers. They are not trained to operate in civilian contexts, and the choice only makes Ruto appear weaker, a president unable to govern using the civilian architecture who must now rely on force. The Ruto administration must change tack. In a speech on 28th of June, he promised a budget that begins with austerity from the executive down, but this is no longer just about the finance bill. Something more fundamental has been broken, and it must be, prepared, be repaired for Kenya to move forward. This is also about restoring trust between citizens and their government, a long-term project that starts with getting the Kenyan Defense Force back in the barracks, releasing everyone who was arrested for protesting for, or recruiting protests, stopping arbitrary detentions, allowing for peaceful protests as the law dictates. The government does apologize to the families of those who have lost their lives in such meaningless ways, and the legislature must constitute the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission to ensure that there is time to properly prepare for the next round of elections. As for Western institutions that continue to use the countries as a global majority as a petri dish for economic experiments, Get your priorities in order. We build economies to serve the people. We don't crush people in order to serve economies. Nanjala Nayabola is a writer, political analyst, and author of Digital Democracy, Analog Politics, How the Internet Era is Transforming Politics in Kenya. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this. Please comment, rate, share, and subscribe. Peace.